Uh, I'm Chris Moore. I am uh, the Dr. George F. Haddock's Community Chair in Physical Science at the University of Nebraska Omaha. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in our introductions, I do discipline-based education research within chemistry and physics. And I also oversee our pre-service teacher programs uh, in, in those disciplines for secondary teachers, as well as in-service programs that we have, graduate programs for that. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is the Flip It Physics product, which is, or in, in, in some ways more generally the Flip It product, because I know that Macmillan has other versions of Flip It. So I'll look at a, a little bit about what it is and uh, what my work has been uh, associated with it. So I've used it within the classroom. We've also done some, some research with it uh, and the Flip Classroom uh, in general. And uh, the title here is How Flip It Physics Can Transform the Instructor into what we're calling a clarifying agent. So some interesting, some interesting uh, uh, observations came out of data many years ago while we were looking at this, and we decided to build a bit of a phenomenological model to understand what was going on. And we're in the process of maybe testing that model now, but no good data to show you for that. So let me start off with by telling you a little bit about what the Flip It product is, what Flip It Physics actually does. So we used, the, you used this many years ago back when it was uh, with Freeman, before I believe before Macmillan acquired Freeman, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but we were a beta test group uh, with the, uh, the authors. So the authors are out of UIUC. They developed this first off as, you know, we, we would see what they were doing at the local, at the area conferences in physics, and then it became a commercial product that was called Smart Physics, and we actually beta tested the commercial product within courses at a university in the southeast. And what it is is it's a, it's a system for setting up a flipped classroom. What does that mean? So first off, what's the student experience? Let's talk about the student experience. So the student would go online and watch a series of pre-lectures. The pre-lectures are built around what are called multimedia learning modules. So they have all kinds of you know, things moving and you can actually see objects turn and they're animated. And then uh, Gary, one of the authors, uh, narrates these, these videos. And that's gonna actually become quite relevant as we go a little bit later. All right. After such, they watch the videos and they, they answer a series of checkpoint questions. And the checkpoint questions are based off of the philosophy of just-in-time teaching. So they watch a lecture, they, essentially somewhat of a passive lecture, but with the multimedia content, which is designed to help reduce cognitive load. And then they, uh, watch these, they, they answer these checkpoint questions, and it's usually between three and four conceptually-based questions. Students get credit for watching the, the pre-lecture, and they get credit for actually answering the checkpoints. And they get 100% credit whether they're right or wrong. The intention here is that the student is providing feedback to the instructor. And now the instructor can, can tailor their lecture or their classroom experience or whatever it is that they're going to do to what are the actual misunderstandings of students as shown through the checkpoint questions, right? So the instructor is going to get a histogram that shows student answers in those checkpoints. Students also have to explain their reasoning for why they have that answer. And so the, the, the instructor can actually go through and actually see student reasoning. Oftentimes we can find that students are getting the right answers, but predominantly for the wrong reasons. So that's also very helpful. And it provides us a lot of data into student thinking as well. Then after their classroom experience, Right, that's whatever it might be, and there's a lot of flexibility in that. Uh, then there's an online homework system that's also built into the Flip It physics. Right, and so that's basically what the product is. Now, I want to talk to you about how we came about working with Flip It physics. So we were doing an implementation of what's called just-in-time teaching, as well as tutorials and in introductory physics. So tutorials and introductory physics was developed by a physics education research group out of the University of Washington. And then the just-in-time teaching, uh, there's actually multiple authors at a large number of different institutions. Right? Just-in-time teaching is as I just described, that, uh, that aspect of the checkpoint. And then the tutorials and introductory physics are actually in-class tutorials where students work together in teams, they're based off of research and common, uh, understand, and common mental models that students have and taking those mental models and transferring them into more expert-like views of physics 
right? And so they're built, built off of decades worth of research. And so they work in teams and the instructor walks around and they, they help and guide them uh, to understanding within physics. So the way we had this implemented was that we would assign reading and we have excellent data that says that that might as well never have happened because students don't read. Uh, we would then give them just-in-time teaching questions that were, a lot of them came from this book, which has a lot of physics questions because one, two, three, four of those authors are physicists. Uh, and then we would have a, a lecture and then the lecture tutorials and sort of a recitation section, and then they would complete online homework. And this was working great, actually. It was working fantastically. We had large learning gains, everything. You know, you don't change things that work. Uh, until I went to a different institution. And all of a sudden, we implemented the exact same model, and it didn't quite work as well. This was one of my first experiences where realizing that populations matter, the population of student that you're working with uh, really matters when you go from teaching all chemistry and physics majors to teaching marine science and biology majors, that you're gonna have to adapt sometimes. And so what we did is we, we I got a call essentially saying, do you wanna test flip it physics? And we, we said yes, and it was called smart physics at the time. So we actually did a, a quasi experiment multi-group quasi-experiment where we took two groups uh, so that we could see the effectiveness of, of flip it physics or of this flipped model. So we took our, our, our traditional model here with reading, just-in-time teaching, lecture, lecture tutorials, and then the online homework. And then we had a second group that went through a slightly different process. Uh, the pre-lectures, which they watched and Gary narrated, uh, the checkpoints that were built within flip it physics product, and then they would, we just skipped this part altogether and went right down to the lecture tutorials. Now, I'd like to point out that the, uh, that the two groups were in the same room with the same instructor for this part, right? And they did the same online homework, all right? So we kept rough, everything roughly, roughly the same. Now, uh, we have a whole paper that describes a lot of the threats to validity, and there are some, right? Uh, but what do we find out? So we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at uh, uh, cognitive achievement. Did they, did they learn physics any better or any different? And then we looked at student affect, which was student um, uh, views about what their classroom experience, views about their instructor. And so uh, one thing we looked at was exam grades. Uh, again, looking at uh, similar exams, this is across four semesters. Uh, so every, all of this is averaged together across four semesters. We have a, a, what we call the non-MLM group, not multi-level marketing, multimedia learning modules, right? And then we have the uh, multimedia learning modules group. So we, we take the commercial product names out when we publish these sorts of things. Uh, but this was the, the, the Flip It Physics group and the non-Flip It Physics group. And we saw an increase in student grades. So there's a, uh, a statistically relevant increase in student grades in the groups that were doing uh, the Flip It Physics modules. We also looked at learning gains, all right, because uh, grades, uh, you know, we're, we don't have a national norm that we can look at with the, the exams that we put together. All we can do is we can compare, uh, in, you know, groups with the same exam. So we looked at learning gains by using what's called the conceptual survey of electricity and magnetism. This was all done in a, what we call a second semester introductory course in physics and in topics in electricity and magnetism. And uh, again, we had, uh, uh, we had the different groups, uh, different uh, populations here, non-MLM group and the multimedia learning module group looking at uh, their average normalized gain on the conceptual survey of electricity and magnetism. And, and that gain is a statistical measure of student learning. And we see uh, much larger gains in the multimedia learning group with roughly average gains are a little below with, for the national average. And this is actually, these numbers being a little below the national average is actually average for the population that we were dealing with because our population was primarily biology, marine science, as opposed to a blend where we would have engineering and uh, physics and chemistry majors where the motivations are different, all right? So we saw a, a fairly uh, a big difference between that. We also looked at uh, effect size, which is a more commonly used measure within education research, both of which showed a pretty big uh, difference between the two groups. And then what was really interesting and where we kind of got a, a, a neat little phenomenological model that came out of it and uh, where we get to, uh, where you're gonna find out where one of the benefits 
of something like Flip It Physics is that now you get to blame Gary for student confusion, <laughs> right? So we, we asked the students uh, about uh, three different dimensions, the, the instructor clarity, and by the way, this is all uh, on the instructor. So we're, it's, a, it's an instructor evaluation. It's not necessarily a course evaluation. It's not an evaluation of the actual uh, materials used within the course. It's an instructor evaluation. We asked them about the instructor's clarity, the atmosphere that the instructor, uh, you know, in, 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 within the classroom that they established, the, how the class time was used and whether they, they found uh, the class time useful, and then the effectiveness of the instructor overall. And again, we looked at the two different groups, uh, the, the Flip It Physics and the non-Flip It Physics group, where the Flip It Physics group is in red, the non-Flip It Physics group is in blue, and we see statistical differences between the two in class time, atmosphere, and clarity. Interestingly enough, no statistical difference between uh, student views about the effectiveness of the instructor. Right. And in fact, actually, that's uh, something that's commonly repeated across uh, large numbers of, of different types of reformed pedagogies, that, that, that students are usually pretty poor at uh, identifying whether instruction was effective or not. And oftentimes they can see uh, if it actually effective instruction, they will view it as less effective because it can be more painful to them. Right? Exactly one of the reasons why they might think that uh, the effectiveness might be uh, slightly different. Now we actually, there seems to be an increase, but we can't necessarily say uh, within our uh, level of confidence. But class time, atmosphere, and clarity. In particular, we're particu we, we were very interested in both class time and clarity. And, and class time, and, and, and really, because there's a, just a walloping difference between the two. It's a pretty large difference between the uh, flip it physics and the non flip it physics group. So how do we explain that? How do we explain students' views on this? If we go back and look at the experiment design, why is the instructor perceived as being more clear and class time more useful? Right? And, and the, the, for us, it didn't make a lot of sense. We weren't expecting to see a, a significant difference here uh, within student, student affect. One of the reasons is because the uh, same instructor is here. It's the same tutorials. They're, they're doing the same thing. Right? The only difference is, uh, and, and we know they're not doing the reading, so our data came out and, and it basically looked like all of the rest of the data amongst uh, physics uh, education folks. There's no difference. They, no one reads. They don't read the book. We can assign it. We can give short quizzes. Right? They skim. They don't actually read the book uh, for comprehension or at least attempt it. Right? So we know that they're not really reading anyway. Um, all we did is we put the lecture in front of just-in-time teaching We'll kind of turn that around a little bit, right? And they're actually seeing the instructor less. Maybe that's it. <laughs> seem more clear because we're we, the less we talk, maybe the more clear we seem to be, right? So we were wondering what exactly might be going on in order to make the instructor seem more clear, and this was reproducible over multiple semesters. So here's sort of what our idea is, and it's based off of the learning cycle and how students actually go through the process of learning. Because learning is a painful experience. It's very difficult and it's very hard. Right? So what happens is with the pre-lectures, Gary confuses them. Because physics is confusing when you're sitting there watching it for the first time. If you sit down and read a textbook, it's confusing. One of the reasons cited by students why they don't read the textbook is because they don't find it effective. They don't feel like they get anything out of it. Maybe they try for the first few weeks and the reading helps them, in, or at least they perceive the reading as not helping them in any way. And when we sit down and did interviews with students, we found out that they felt Gary was confusing and he confused them. Now you can see where I'm going with this. They thought Gary was confusing and Gary confused them as opposed to the instructor confusing them, right? Because we all know that as instructors, we walk in and we start off on a concept and it's going to be hard and challenging, right? And then clarification is going to happen as we go throughout and students eventually have an aha moment or you know, maybe we have them in group work and their colleagues help them out. And so they say, well, my friends taught me and they didn't do anything. Although you're setting up. We're setting up the, the, what Gary does is he's setting up the situation where the student now knows what they don't know. 
and that's their first step. The student now knows what they don't know. They do the checkpoints, right? And now the instructor knows what they don't know. And so now we can tailor that instruction through our tutorials and go back to those questions again, right? We're clarifying the checkpoints for them as an instructor in the classroom. We're clarifying the lecture as an instructor in the classroom, right? They go and they do the homework and then that cycle can repeat, right? Where the uh, instructor is acting as the clarifying agent within the room. So ultimately, these three guys, that's uh, Matt, Scary, and uh, Tim, are introducing the concept with all of the frustration that that entails. And then uh, very good-looking instructors get to come in <laughs> and clarify everything uh, for the group. And that's the best picture I could find because I have no pictures of me actually with a group of students, which would have been better. Right? Students are better prepared for these tutorials, right? Uh, so that means that makes they feel that that's going to make class time more effective. So rather than struggling to even know where to begin, they have a base point and they can focus then instead on those tricky aspects. Now this is actually a phenomenological model that came out of our observations that we can test. Right? We haven't done it yet, but it may happen. We can't test it with the existing software. And fortunately, right? But uh, it is a model that we can test. We can set up a, a second uh, experiment with two groups, only this time we take the pre-lectures and we have them narrated by instructor A. And then we have the class run by instructor A. And then we can set up a second group where, exact, where, where they're in the exact same room doing the exact same uh, tutorials, exact same classroom activities, and it doesn't even need to be these lecture tutorials, it could be something else, as long as it's the same. With instructor A, but pre-lectures, same pre-lectures, same animations, same content, just narrated by a different instructor. And then we can, uh, we can actually test this uh, model. And so that's something that uh, we uh, start at work on some things happened in the technology aspect on that, but we're back to working on that. I got a colleague in South Carolina that's been uh, trying to run that experiment. So what's next? This is, isn't even a product that's being talked about because it's very specific to physics, but this is actually a Macmillan product too that we've been, uh, again, uh, trialing. Uh, we've been running pilots within our, our labs. And what we're working on is reforming the physics lab using a, another invention of the same research group at UIUC and the same set of authors called the IO lab. And the IO lab is a small little device. It's a little cart. It's got wheels on the bottom. You can see them right here with wheel sensors. It's got uh, um, all kinds of different sensors, uh, lots of places there for multimeters, for measuring current, for me measuring voltage. We can put it on a table and just roll it right across and collect data on both its position, its velocity, and its acceleration, right? Put it on a ramp and roll it down, all with one device and then very simple uh, you, you, things, right? Just little, little thing. In fact, we have one lab where we take masking tape rolls, and I don't know if it was just Gary uh, or Matt's that designed this, uh, was just a genius or it just accidentally happened that those tape rolls fit exactly <laughs> over it so that it, you can actually roll it down hills this tumbling way so we can actually look at its moment of inertia and a whole bunch of other things. Now that's a cool device but you can actually do the labs with just about any sort of device. We're focusing on the pedagogy working with Matt's group at UIUC and we're going to talk about that at the American Association of Physics Teachers in July. So if you just happen to be in um, wherever that conference is, uh, in Provo, Utah in July, then uh, stop by and pay $500 for the conference fee and <laughs> you can come in. And, and that's all I have for you today. <laughs>